Welcome to the Madison Miller Podcast. Today is Wednesday, January 15th, 2020. Today I'm going to recap yesterday's college basketball, NBA, and NHL games. Look ahead to tonight's games. Um, What we know and what I question with the Big East, the Big Ten, and the Big 12 for college basketball. A couple coaching and managerial changes in baseball and hockey. A shocking NFL retirement and my best bet of the day. Okay, we'll start with college basketball. We'll go through last night's games and look ahead to tonight. There were some shocking results. Um, There were some interesting results and whatnot, so here we go. Number 21, Ohio State over Nebraska, 80-68. Ohio State ends its losing streak. They are 12 and 5. Nebraska 7 and 10. Clemson upsets number 3 Duke 79-72. That was the biggest result of last night. Clemson 9 and 7, Duke 15 and 2. Number 11 Louisville over Pitt 73-68 in overtime. Louisville 14 and 3, Pitt 11 and 6. Bowling Green over Western Michigan 85-82. Bowling Green 12 and 5, Western Michigan 8 and 9. Buffalo over Ohio, 76-73. Buffalo, 11-6. Ohio, 9-8. Florida over Ole Miss, 71-55. Florida, 11-5. Ole Miss, 9-7. LSU over Texas A&M, 89-85 in overtime. So the uh, college football letdown um, almost worked for LSU, but uh, they avoided it by uh, getting it done in overtime. LSU, 12-4. A&M, 8-7. Meanwhile, Clemson... Avoided the letdown. Um, Richmond over Davidson, 70-64. Richmond, 13-4. Davidson, 7-9. Miami of Ohio over Kent State, 77-74. Miami of Ohio, 8-9. Kent State, 13-4. So that was a uh, pretty surprising upset there. Central Michigan over Toledo, 74-67. Central Michigan, 10-7. Toledo, 9-8. Ball State over Eastern Michigan, 69-52. Ball State, 10-7. Eastern Michigan, 10-7. Number 13, Dayton over VCU, 79-65. Dayton, 15-2. VCU, 12-5. Number 23, Texas Tech over Kansas State, 77-63. Tech, 11-5. Kansas State, 7-9. Akron over Northern Illinois, 72-49. Akron covers there, 14-3. Northern Illinois, 9-8. UCF over Tulane, 74-55. UCF, 10-7. Tulane, 10-7. Iowa over Northwestern, 75-62. Iowa 12 and 5, Northwestern 6 and 10. Number 14, Villanova over DePaul 79 75 in overtime. Villanova 13 and 3, DePaul 12 and 5. Number 6, Kansas over Oklahoma 66 52. Damian Dotson, or Devin Dotson didn't play. Damian Dotson's uh, from the New York Knicks. Devin Dotson's from Kansas, who is now 13 and 3, Oklahoma 11 and 5. Number 12, West Virginia over TCU, 81-49. West Virginia, 14-2. TCU, 12-4. Wisconsin over number 17, Maryland, 56-54. Maryland absolutely choked in this game. Um, There was a big defensive play or turnover when Maryland was up by one. And then he follows it up with the game-winning three. I'm talking about um, Davison from Wisconsin, who is on a roll now. They're 11-6. Maryland's 13-4. Mississippi State over Missouri, 72-45. Mississippi State, 10-6. Missouri, 9-7. Vatek over Wake Forest, 80-70. Vatek, 13-4. Wake, 8-8. Nevada over Wyoming, 68-67. Nevada, 11-7. Wyoming, 5-14. Number 7, San Diego State over Fresno State, 64-55. San Diego State, 18-0. Fresno, 5-12. Tonight's slate, there's actually one final, Lafayette over Colgate, 71-67. Lafayette, 11-5. Colgate, 13-5. This was an 11 a.m. tip. 5 o'clock ESPNU, St. Francis, Pennsylvania, and Fairleigh Dickinson. St. Fran Pensy is a two-point favorite. That line is a complete fake. This is one of the worst lines I've seen all year. Fairleigh Dickinson's been terrible. St. Francis, Pennsylvania has been pretty solid. That, too, is a steal. I think I'd make this, like, seven. So give me St. Francis, Pennsylvania. They're going to win this game by double digits. 
Six o'clock Central Connecticut State, Sacred Heart. Six thirty Fox Sports One, number eighteen Seton Hall, number five Butler. Butler's a four and a half point home favorite. We'll talk about Butler a lot when we get to the uh, what we know and what I question. They've been really, really good this year. Kamar Baldwin's been awesome. Um, Miles Powell's also been awesome for Seton Hall when he's been healthy. Um, I think that Butler's a little overvalued right now in the market because of their record. And Seton Hall's undervalued because they missed a lot of, um, or I'm sorry, they were not ranked for a while. Now they're back in the rankings. They're 18. Miles Powell's back and healthy. I'm going to take Seton Hall plus the points. I am going to go on a ballsy call here and say that they're going to win the game outright. So it's going to be Seton Hall plus the four and a half. 6.30 SEC Network, number 10, Kentucky and South Carolina. Kentucky's a five and a half point favorite. This reminds me of Florida the other day. When they were giving one less point in the spot and they covered easily. Kentucky's a better team than Florida. They're going to cover easily. So give me Kentucky minus five and a half at South Carolina. ACC Network, Boston College at Syracuse. Syracuse is giving a whopping 11. Give me BC. Syracuse is overvalued off the Virginia win. Syracuse is going to win, but it'll be by single digits. 7 o'clock is PNU, uh, or two I should say. Virginia at number nine, Florida State. Florida State's giving six and a half. Tough one. I'm going to lay it. Virginia, to me, is in a spiral, and I'm fading them until they show me something. So give me Florida State, who's been on a roll, lying the six and a half, and they are a top ten team in the country right now, and they're obviously ranked ninth. Seven o'clock, CBS Sports Network, number 25, Creighton at Georgetown. Georgetown's giving three and a half. Um, Give me Creighton plus the points. Well, they went out right. I'm going to say yes, but um, I don't feel good about that part, but I do feel good about them covering the number. I can see a world where Georgetown wins by two. Creighton's ranked. Georgetown's not. Um, Georgetown has some turmoil and stuff in program that I think that they probably won't recover from. So give me Creighton plus a three and a half. ESPNU, Tennessee, Georgia. Georgia's minus three. Um, I think Tennessee's overvalued right now because they are just playing a little better, and they have some nice wins lately. But the best player in the court is Anthony Edwards, giving Georgia minus five, or minus three. I would make it five. Fordham to Kane on ESPN+. Plus. The Kane's a whopping 17.5 point favorite. That's big. Um, Fordham is not very good, we know. But I think that's a big line. I think... Uh, for once, DeCane's overvalued. So give me uh, Fordham plus 17 and a half. DeCane will obviously win the game. I'm going to say by 14. George Mason, George Washington. George Mason's a three-point road favorite. They're coming off a win. Um, and uh, Washington really isn't that good. Um, this line is screaming. Take George Washington. It's a trap game. I'm taking Mason. Don't feel good about it, though. Vermont, Binghamton, UMass, Lowell, Maine, Albany, New Hampshire, Bucknell, American, Late, Navy, Lehigh, ACC Network, Miami, NC State. NC State's giving 8.5. Take, I'm taking Miami plus the points. Um, I think these two teams are pretty even, and I think NC State's getting a little too much credit. I think it's a close game. NC State probably wins, though. Study Brook, Hartford, VMI, Mercer. Tulsa at East Carolina. Tulsa's giving two and a half on the road. Tulsa's playing well. I think this is a trap game. Give me East Carolina plus the points. I think they'll win outright. UMass against St. Bonaventure. Bonaventure's a nine-point favorite. Bonaventure's playing well right now. Give me Bonaventure minus the points. St. Peter's, Fairfield, Indiana, Rutgers on the Big Ten Network. Rutgers is giving three and a half at home. Tough one. I'm going to take Indiana plus the three in the hook. Um... Rutgers, I think, is a team that people are jumping on the bandwagon a little bit, coming off some big wins. But give me Indiana plus the three and a half. I think they win. Bryant, Merrimack, UNC Greensboro, the Citadel, Sanford East, Tennessee State, Western Carolina, Furman, Evansville, Indiana State, Wofford, Chattanooga, LIU, St. Francis, Brooklyn, Army, Holy Cross, 730, Incarnate Word of McNeese, Rhode Island, St. Joe's. Rhode Island's a seven and a half point road favorite. Um, Davidson covered last week against Davidson at home, but Rhode Island's a better team than Davidson. So give me Rhode Island minus the seven and a half. I don't feel super about it though. 
ESPN Plus at 8 o'clock. Iowa State at number two. Baylor. Baylor's a eight and a half point home favorite. I think they're overvalued here, so give me the Cyclones plus the points. Um, I think it's just, just a close game. Maybe Iowa State has a lead at halftime. Baylor comes from Ryan and wins by maybe four points. So give me Iowa State plus the points here. Northwestern State Nichols. A&M Corpus Christi Southeast Louisiana. Bradley, Missouri State, Valparaiso, Northern Iowa, North Dakota, North Dakota, or South Dakota State, South Dakota, North Dakota State. That's kind of confusing there. That North Dakota's at South Dakota State, and then South Dakota's at North Dakota State. That's weird. Um, Sam Houston State, Lamar, New Orleans, Houston Baptist, Xavier, Marquette. Marquette's giving three and a half. I'm taking the Golden Eagles. They're playing well right now. Marcus Howard's the best player on the court. Texas, Oklahoma State on ESPN Plus. Oklahoma State's laying three and a half. Give me Texas plus the three in the hook. Three in the hook's a popular line tonight, and I'm taking most of the dogs other than Marquette. Um, I think Texas is going to uh, win this game outright. There, I think they're the better team. Stephen F. Austin in Central Arkansas. Vandy at Arkansas. Arkansas is a three and a half point favorite. 830 SEC Network. Vandy played Auburn close. I think that they could play Arkansas close too, but... Um, I obviously don't think that Vanderbilt will win. I just think it'll cover the big number. Fox Sports 1, 830. St. John's at Providence. Providence is laying 5.5. I'm going to lay the number. They're playing very well right now. Um, I think this is a bounce-back spot after the Butler loss. So give me Providence minus the 5.5. Notre Dame, Georgia Tech. Georgia Tech's a 1.5 point favorite. Um, tough one here. Um, this is one of those scenarios where you're like, Notre Dame's getting a point and a half against a bad Georgia Tech team? I'm all in. I'm taking Georgia Tech. I think the line is weird, and um, it's telling you to take... Uh, it's begging you to take the favorite, but it's telling you to take the favorite. Or begging you to take the dog, telling you to take the favorite. 9 o'clock ESPN 2. Number four, Auburn at Alabama. Auburn is now down to a one and a half point favorite. It was at two... And a half now, it went down to two. Now it's at one and a half. I love Auburn. Um, I think that this is just a popular fade spot. Um, this reminds me a lot of when West Virginia went to Oklahoma State, and then Oklahoma State closed as a favorite, and West Virginia ended up winning the game outright as a ranked underdog. We might see that here as a rare ranked undefeated 15-0 and underdog on the road against an 8-7 and team. I love Auburn. They're the better team, better coach. Um, all due respect to Nate Oates, who I think is going to be a good coach at Alabama. But I just think Auburn is the better team. So give me Auburn minus the point and the half here. ESPNU, number 16, Wichita State at Temple. Wichita is a four and a half point favorite. I'm going to take the favorite here as well. Um, I don't think Temple is as good as it was under Fran Dunphy. And I just think that Wichita's on a roll right now. So give me Wichita minus four and a half. Big Ten, every Penn State, Minnesota. Minnesota's a two-point favorite. I'm taking Minnesota. Um, it's telling you to take Minnesota, but it's begging you to take Penn State. Um, Penn State's out of the rankings because of the loss to Rockers. Um, Penn State, I think, still a good team, but I just think it's a tough spot. So give me Minnesota minus the points. CBS Sports Network, SMU at Houston. Houston's a seven-point favorite. These two teams are combined 24-7, and seven, which is incredible. Um... Give me SMU plus the points. I think Houston wins, but SMU covers. I just think Houston's getting too much credit from the Diamond Classic down in Hawaii. And um, SMU, I think, is um, uh, overreaction because they lost to um, South or I'm sorry, East Carolina last weekend. And like I said, Houston's getting credit for the Diamond Classic still, and they just lost to Tulsa themselves. So um, give me... SMU plus the seven, but Houston wins. Boise State at Air Force. Boise's a point and a half favorite on the road. I'm taking Boise here. Um, I think that this line should be three and a half or four. Um, I don't think Air Force is very good, so give me Boise minus the point and a half. I don't think Boise's all that great either, but just a spot play. Um New Mexico at Colorado State. Um, New Mexico riding high 15 and 3. Colorado State is a four and a half point favorite. New Mexico is getting four and a half. 
I think they're going to win the game outright. They're the better team. Colorado State isn't terrible by any stretch of the imagination. But honestly, the wrong team's favored. Or at the worst, this should be a pick em. So give me New Mexico plus the four and a half. They're going to win the game outright. UTSA, UTEP. 10 o'clock Pac-12 Network, Stanford and UCLA. UCLA is a one-point favorite. Um, I'm taking UCLA. I'm sorry. Stanford's a better team probably, but um, it's another situation. It's begging you to take Stanford, but it's telling you to take UCLA. Give me UCLA. UC Irvine, Cal State Fullerton, 11 o'clock. San Jose State, UNLV. UNLV is a whopping 12.5-point home favorite. Give me the Spartans to cover the number. I think it's a closer game than 12.5. I just think that the market still thinks San Jose State is this dumpster fire, hot trash garbage. Meanwhile, they're improved. And um, they're not good, but they're not the dumpster fire that people claim they are. So um, I just think this game's a lot closer, but I do expect UNLV to win. NBA. I'm going to go over the uh, scores from last night and look ahead to tonight's games. Hawks over the Suns, 123-110. Hawks, 9-32. Phoenix, 16-24. Jazz over the Nets, 118-107. Jazz, 28-12. Brooklyn, 18-21. Bucks over the Knicks, 128-102. Milwaukee, 36-6. New York, 11-30. Grizzlies over the Rockets, 121-110. Grizzlies, 19-22. Houston, 26-13. Mavs over the Warriors, 124-97. Mavs, 25-15. Golden State, 9-33. Clippers over the Cavs, 128-103. Clippers, 28-3. Cleveland, 12-29. Tonight's slate, 7 o'clock. Pistons, Celtics. On ESPN, you have the Nets at the Sixers. Phillies, a 7.5 point favor on the call this game. I'm going to say it's probably Mike Breen. And Doris Burke, um, no Knicks tonight, so I do expect Mike Breen to be calling one of the two games. Um, maybe it's more likely he calls the second game because he was in Milwaukee last night, obviously. But uh, maybe he makes a red eye back to Philly. This just feels like a game that he and Doris would call, or he and Hubie Brown. Wouldn't rule out Ryan Rucco, but um, Rucco's obviously the second TV voice of the Brooklyn Nets. But they did just have Mike Breen call the Knicks game the other night on TV, so... Um, you never know. And MSG didn't even air the game either. So the Pelican fans, uh, I don't think that the Pelican, maybe the Pelicans TV did air it um, on ESPN. But um, if they didn't, then, then they would have to deal with kind of uh, a situation that a lot of fan bases really don't like, which is uh, getting the opposing team's uh, play-by-play announcer on national TV, which um, could be... Uh, Tricky sometimes because they, uh, that announcer sometimes is a bit of a homer. But maybe, uh, um, you avoid that case if, uh, um, Ruko, uh, because Ruko is not really perceived to be a little bit of a homer. But, um, you never know. Um, because sometimes it just comes out and they, they forget what air they're on. But anyway, I do think it'll either be Breen or uh, Ruko tonight on the game. Philly's laying seven and a half. Um, tough one. I'm going to lay it with the Sixers. Um, I think that they are the better team right now. Um, what scares me here is no Embiid. So that's the case for Brooklyn. But I just think that... Um, Ben Simmons, Tobias Harris, Al Horford will step up. Um, God, I don't think I've ever switched a pick when making picks against the spread. But that number is so dead on. But I just think that um, this is like a 10-point game. But I'm going to be regretting it if Brooklyn uh, um, wins by two and they win the game outright. 7.30 Spurs at the Heat, 8 o'clock Raptors at the Thunder, Wizards at the Bulls, Pacers at the Timberwolves, 9 o'clock Hornets at the Nuggets, 9.30 ESPN, Trailblazers at the Rockets, Houston's an 8.5 point favorite. I'm going to say this is Dave Pash and Jeff Van Gundy. Um, 
Houston's an eight and a half point favorite. Um, tough one here. Um, Portland's been playing a little bit better lately. They should be the more desperate team here. Um, Russell Westbrook is back tonight for the Rockets, who are on the second of a back-to-back, so there's the bounce-back case for Houston. But I'm going to take the points. I just think it's close. Dame will keep a minute. I'm going to say the Rockets win by six. 10 o'clock, Mavs Kings, 10.30, Magic at the Lakers. Now we'll talk some hockey. Go over um, last night's busy slate and look ahead to tonight's deck of games. Sabres over to Golden Knights, 4-2. Sabres, 21-19-7. Vegas, 24-19-6. I'll talk about some news regarding the Vegas Golden Knights in a couple of minutes on the podcast. Maple Leafs over to Devils, 7-4. Leafs, 25-16-6. Devils, 17-22-7. Lightning over to Kings, 4-3 in a shootout. Lightning, 28-14-4. Kings, 18-25-5. Islanders over the Red Wings, 8-2. Islanders 28, 13, and 4. Detroit 12, 32, and 3. Penguins over to Wild 7 to 3. Penguins 29, 12, and 5. Minnesota 20, 20, and 6. And Sidney Crosby came back for the Pens in that game. Blue Jackets over to Bruins 3 0. Good win for Columbus 23, 16, and 8. They're playing well. Boston 27, 9, and 12. Blackhawks over to Senators 3 2 in overtime. Blackhawks 21, 20, and 6. Ottawa. 16, 22, and 8. Jets over to Canucks, 4 0. Jets, 25, 18, and 4. Vancouver, 25, 18, and 4. It's crazy that those two teams have identical records. Stars over to Avs, 3 2 in overtime. Stars, 27, 15, and 4. They're playing well. Colorado, 25, 15, and 6. Oilers over to Preds, 4 2. Oilers, 25, 18, and 5. Nashville, 21, 17, and 7. Coyotes over to Sharks, 6 to 3. Coyotes 26, 18, and 5. San Jose 21, 23, and 4. Tonight's slate, 7.30. Blackhawks, Canadians, 8 o'clock. NBC, SN, Flyers, Blues. Dr. Emmerich, Eddie Olchek, Brian Boucher on the call in all likelihood. Um, although in the second half of the season, you won't see Doc Emmerich a lot on the Wednesday night games. Maybe you'll see Kenny Albert tonight. Maybe you'll see John Forslund. You never know, but... Like I said, in the second half of the year, you don't see Doc very much doing the Wednesday night games. You'll see him like doing the big games on NBC or the All-Star game, and then he's back for the playoffs. Um, St. Louis is a pretty big favorite here. Um, Philly is a worse team on the road than they are at home. I'll take the Blues here. Um, don't feel good about it. No Carter Hart for a couple weeks for the Flyers. That's a loss. But I'll take the Blues to win. I think it's competitive tonight. Now we'll talk a little bit of hockey news that came out this morning that the Vegas Golden Knights have fired Gerard Gallant as their head coach. That's a surprise move. Nobody saw this coming. Um, I think a lot of people are trying to follow the Blues model from last year and the Penguins from a few years ago and they fired a coach in the middle of the year and changed coaches and it leads to a turnaround. Um, The only one I think has a a chance to work out as of right now could very well, um, Vegas could be another one that works out, but I think the most likely one to work out is Toronto. That's the most likely. Um, They're playing a lot better. They were not even close to the playoff picture when they fired Babcock and now they're in the top three in their division. But, like I said, shocking firing. This is Vegas' third year and their second head coach. And they hired Pete DeBoer, the ex-Devils and Sharks coach, to replace them. DeBoer's been to two Stanley Cup Finals, one with the Sharks and one with the Devils. He went to the Finals in his first year as coach of the, the, uh, the Sharks. And then they ended up losing... Um, to uh, the Penguins in that first of the back-to-back championships. So yeah, surprising move to say the least. We'll see how this works out. Right now, as we speak, the Golden Knights are in 
Um, not even in the playoffs. Right now, they are tied with the Winnipeg Jets for the final wild card spot. And three points back of the Coyotes in the division. Vegas to win the division is an interesting bet right now. And the Nashville's five points back of the wild card. And they obviously made the change last week. Um, but yeah, we've seen a, a lot of coaching changes this year. We had the Devils. We had the Golden Knights. We had the Sharks. We had the Predators. That's four. I just listed the three from the West. I, missed, uh, I said Vegas, San Jose, Nashville, New Jersey. Um, I think there could be more coming. Maybe Detroit makes a move. Maybe Montreal. Um, I don't think the Rangers will make a move. Maybe that will be at the end of the year now that some better coaches are available. And David Quinn, I think, has done some nice things. But you go out and sign Artemi Panarin and trade for Jacob Trouba, I don't think the Rangers were expecting to be in the lottery again. Although um, they kind of are saying that they're rebuilding. But reality, it's the New York Rangers we're talking about, not the Ottawa Senators. So um, I don't think it's crazy if the Rangers move on from David Quinn. Um, another one I think um, is not out of the question, and this would be an after-the-season one as well, Tampa Bay with John Cooper if they don't advance far enough in the playoffs. Um Calgary had to make a change in season, but that was due to um, off-ice issues. And in Winnipeg is another candidate, but I think that's after the season potentially. So a lot of coaching changes this year in the National Hockey League, and we'll see how this one for Vegas turns out. A shocking NFL retirement I want to talk about. And that is Luke Heakley of the Carolina Panthers. Such a surprising move. Um, I don't think anybody expected this the coming at all. Um, he is 28 years old. He was the 2012 Defensive Rookie of the Year, the 2013 Defensive Player of the Year. Obviously, 2013 was the year that Cam Newton had his breakout season and the Panthers were the two seed in the NFC, got a bye, and then were one and done. They lost to the 49ers in the divisional round with Colin Kaepernick and Jim Harbaugh. So that was the year that Luke Keekley won Defensive Player of the Year. He made seven Pro Bowls. He missed seven games in his career due to concussions. He made a very um, touching, emotional video that the Panthers tweeted out on their Twitter account, and that's how the announcement was made. And we've had some shocking NFL retirements over the last couple years. Obviously, um, Keekly just now. You had Andrew Luck last year, Calvin Johnson in 2015. Um, you had that young kid from the 49ers. That retired a few years ago. Can't think of the name on top of my head. But yeah, this Kiki one is one that nobody saw coming. Elite player in the league. And he'll certainly be missed by the Carolina Panthers. And now uh, Matt Rule was just dealt a pretty big blow in his first couple weeks here as uh, head coach of the Carolina Panthers. And now... Um, they have to replace him somehow, and that's going to be very difficult for um, uh, the Panthers to do because of how good Keekley was as a player. Now we're going to do what we know and what I question regarding the Big East, Big 12, and the Big 10. We're going to start with the Big East. Um, we're going to go in alphabetical order as we did yesterday for the AAC and the big, or I'm sorry, the uh, the ACC. Um, we'll start with Butler. What we know is that this team is much better than anybody could have expected. They have one loss on the season, and that came at Baylor. Um, and now 
They're being talked about as a possible one seed. Now the question is, can this team make a Final Four run? So it should be very interesting. Next up is Creighton. Um, what we know is that this team has a nice balance to it with its scoring attack. They have some nice guys that could uh, get off and get hot at any night. And uh, my question for them is that will they be in the rankings for the rest of the season? Right now they're 25th. Um, um, so we'll see. They are probably going to make the tournament, but my question is that how long or how much of the season will they be in the rankings for? The Paul. Non-con was fun. Conference play has not been so fun. In non-con, they upset teams like Texas Tech, and they picked off, I believe, Iowa. And then in conference play rolls around, reality sets in, you're still the Paul. And my question for them is, that can they make the tournament for the first time in years? Um, they still have a lot of conference play to go. They still have to play some of the teams that are at their level at home, like St. John's and Georgetown and teams like that. So they have opportunities to pick up some wins. And speaking of Georgetown, they're next. My question, or I'm sorry, what we know is that they have a wacky resume. Um, they have that upset win over Texas. They have an upset win over Oklahoma State. Um, they have a weird buy loss to uh, UNC Greensboro. And my question for them is, Will the in-season suspensions of Josh LeBlanc and James Akinjo come back and haunt them in the end? I think it's more likely than not. Marquette. Marcus Howard continues to be a beast. This guy is likely to be the winner, if not the runner-up, for the Big East Player of the Year. It's between him and Miles Powell, in my opinion. But my question for them is, will the losses of the Hauser brothers eventually come back to haunt them? Um... So far, it really hasn't because they're 12-4 and four and playing pretty well. But when it comes to uh, postseason play and need some buckets down the stretch and uh, teams are going to be double-teaming Marcus Howard, they're going to be thinking, hmm. Providence. This team is turning a corner after a slow start. Sands the, lost the Butler the other night. They are playing very, very well right now. Um... They've had some weird losses, and then they had some big wins to uh, kind of uh, mask it a little bit. And my question for them is, can they grab an at-large bid? Um, I think if the hot playing conference play continues, then yes. We're going to talk about a Big Ten team that's in a similar spot as Providence, but I think they're more likely to get in the tournament than Providence. We'll see who that is in a couple minutes. Seton Hall. This team is arguably the Big East's best team when healthy. Obviously, um, their losses have come when Miles Powell has not been healthy. Um, and now he's back and playing at a high level. They have some pretty nice wins as well. They have a win over Maryland. Um, they lost to Oregon by two points, and Powell played in that game. The other guy that they are waiting on to come back for them this season is uh, Junior Sandro Mamoskelly. He's somebody that's been hurt for a little while now, and if he comes back, look out. So, should be an interesting stretch here for Seton Hall. And my question for them is, can they finally break through this year? You have Powell. You could have Mamaskelly back. You have some other good players. Quincy McKnight's had a nice year for them. Um... Another guy that I really like on this team as a big man is Romaro Gill. And I really think that um, this is a team that can get hot. And Powell is someone that um, I think it's fair to say gives you a chance to win when he's on the court. St. John's. They have a wacky resume. 
They have wins over West Virginia and Arizona. They have a loss against Vermont. Granted, Vermont might be the uh, America East representative in the tournament. And my question for them is, will those big wins outweigh bad losses come March? Right now, St. John's is 11-5 and 0-3 and in Big East play. Actually, no, I'm 1-3. My bad, they recently beat the Paul. Mustafa Haron's a good player. Um, they have some other guys that I like on the team. Like uh, LJ Figueroa, who's a good wing player. They have a tough schedule coming up. They're at Providence tonight. Seton Hall comes to MSG on Saturday. They're at Marquette, at the Paul, and then uh, home Villanova to uh, close out uh, the month here. So they got to um, get back on the right ship a little bit. And then their other loss in non-con play was to Arizona State, who has been a disappointment in the Pac-12. We'll get to them on tomorrow's podcast. Villanova. This team continues to fly under the radar. Villanova is not mentioned in the same sentence as Kansas, Duke, and Michigan State and Gonzaga. I think they should. They're 13-3, and 4-1 and one in the Big East. Um, three losses are at Ohio State when Ohio State was peaking against Baylor, who just beat Kansas. And you know who else beat Kansas? Villanova. And they lost that Marquette by 11. And meanwhile, uh, Marquette has Marcus Howard. And then they've won three straight since the Marquette loss. They have UConn Butler at Providence at St. John's to close out the month. So I really do think with this team kind of rounding in the forum a little bit that they should be mentioned among the better teams in the sport. Although they um, don't seem to be getting credit. And my question for them is, can they win their third title in five seasons? I think they absolutely can. If the bracket breaks right for them, if they get a good seed, I think that this is probably a one, two, three, or four seed. I mean, those are the the, the seeds that I wouldn't rule out for this team. And if it goes kind of bad, maybe a five. But um, most likely probably a three seed as of now. But um, this team is really, really good. And Jade Wright's awesome. Xavier, this team has regressed from a hot start, and my question is, can they turn this around? Um, they have some good players. They're one in three in conference play. Their one win was against St. John's, oh, two weeks ago, oh, about two weeks ago. To close out the month, they have at Marquette, Georgetown at Creighton, Marquette. So maybe they can go two and two there, and the. Uh, Maybe three and one, they can ride the ship a little bit. You never know. So um, I'm a little concerned about Xavier right now. And then uh, on we go to the Big Ten. Illinois. Brad Underwood is finally getting his guys to provide results. Um, they have some big upset wins this year. And um, Underwood is a really good coach. And um, my question is, can they make a tournament run? Obviously, um, Underwood's teams from his other stops have made some runs to the tournament, and obviously uh, Stephen F. Austin had the big upset over West Virginia, and then they upset somebody else a few years ago. I can't think of in my head who it was. Indiana. This finally looks like the year that Archie Miller gets them to the tournament. Year three for him in the first two years of the disappointments. Um, and my question for the Hoosiers is about... One of their star freshman players, I'm obviously talking about Trace Jackson Davis. Can he win the Big Ten Freshman of the Year? Or I should say, will he win that award? I think he probably is the favorite right now because he's led this team in scoring a lot and he might end up turning out to be a first-round pick this year. Iowa. Luca Garza is fun to watch. Question, can Garza contend for Big Ten Player of the Year? Um, I think that it's unlikely that he wins, but I won't be shocked if he's in the top five of the voting. Maryland, they're awesome at home, not so much on the road, as last night proved. And my question is, 
how would they handle a neutral site in the postseason? Um, obviously, this could be a Dark Horse Final Four pick for some people, but I'm not sure how they can handle a neutral site game. Michigan. This is not the same team from the Bahamas. My question is, can they get back to that level? Michigan State. This team, since the Purdue loss, has begun to take off. My question is, will Cassius Winston win the National Player of the Year? I think that he is in play, but I think he has competition. Minnesota. Daniel Oturu is one of the underrated big men in the Big Ten. And my question is, is this it for Richard Patino at Minnesota? They're 9-7, and seven, probably not going to make the tournament. And um, obviously, uh, Patino has been on everybody's hot seat list pretty much the last few years, ever since his dad got fired from Louisville. Nebraska. They have a strange resume. They have a lot of bye losses. I remember they lost their first game of the year. But they have some nice upset wins over Iowa and over Purdue. And my question for them is, how much spoiler can they play for the rest of the year? Because I don't think this seems very good. Northwestern. This is easily the worst team in the conference. And my question for them is, is Chris Collins' job in danger? Ohio State. This team has collapsed after a hot start. I know they won against Nebraska the other day, but Nebraska stinks. And my question for them is that can they get back to the level they were in non-con play? Penn State. Lamar Stevens has carried this team to respectability. Question. Can Pat Chambers save his job? Purdue. They have a weird resume. Question. Can they sneak into the dance? They obviously have the weird resume because they have some weird losses against DePaul and a bunch of other weird teams. Meanwhile, they have the upset win over um, Michigan State from recently. And I think that there's a chance that they do sneak into the dance if they get hot in conference play. Rutgers. Steve Pickle has done a fantastic job here. Um... And question is, can Pickle win the National Coach of the Year? I think he's in play, especially if they make the tournament. Wisconsin, this team has turned a corner. Question, can they make a tournament run? I do think they'll make the tournament. This is the team I was comparing Providence to a little bit. But I think that Wisconsin has a better chance to sustain it than Providence. Last but not least, the Big 12, Baylor. They have the best resume in the country. They have the win at Kansas, the win at Texas Tech. They have a neutral win against Villanova. They have a win over Butler. And their lone loss came against, I want to say it was against the, I want to say it was like Seton Hall or something like that. I think it was a Big East team. Let's see. Who was Baylor's lone loss against? Washington in the second game of the year. They lost by three in Alaska. So other than that, if they won that game, they're the unanimous number one right now. Um, and my question is, that can they actually win the national title? We'll see. Iowa State. They have not lived up to expectations this season. Obviously, they uh, have a good coach and they have some talent, but um, they have some weird losses and they just haven't lived up to them expectations. And my question for them is, can Raseel Bolton win the Big 12 Freshman of the Year? I'm not so sure. I think I know who the favorite is and we'll get to him in a couple of minutes. Kansas. Yudika Azabuki being healthy is the big difference from this year from last year. And my question for them is, is this Bill Self's final season at Kansas? Um, obviously on New Year's, it was a famous prediction made by uh, Seth Greenberg saying that Self was going to leave Kansas for the Spurs. And he mentioned among the reasons was because of the uh, um, upcoming penalty for Kansas and a possible tournament ban. So maybe he's looking at a get free out of jail card here. Kansas State, this is the conference's worst team. My question is, is Bruce Weber's job in jeopardy? Oklahoma, 
Lon Kruger has got this team playing hard as always. And my question is, can they get a top eight seed in, in the big dance? I think how they do in conference play is, goes a long way. Oklahoma State. This team is falling apart after a hot start. My question is, can they turn around and play good spoiler? I'm not so sure. I don't think they're a tournament team by any stretch. TCU. They've been a nice surprise this season, and I think um, among the biggest surprises in the Big 12. But obviously that title goes to Baylor because they have one loss on the year. And my question is, can this team get a top 16 in the, in the dance? I didn't think that this team was a tournament team coming into this year, and I've been wrong. Texas. They have a weird resume. They have a win at Purdue. They have a couple weird losses. Georgetown among them. And my question for them is, is Jock a smart job in jeopardy? I think, depending on how the rest of the season goes, that's going to unfold. Texas Tech, they have a weird resume as well. They have the upset win over Louisville at MSG. They have a loss to, the, um, to DePaul, a loss to Iowa. They have a home loss to Baylor, although Baylor, we know what Baylor is right now. But my question for them is that can they make another long tournament run? Chris Beard is an outstanding coach, and um, this is obviously a team that um, plays well in big spots and when they're doubted. And last but not least, West Virginia, what we know is that they're in the midst of a good and in some ways predictable bounce back season after last season's uh Somewhat disaster. It wasn't really a disaster because they made the Big 12 semifinals in the tournament. And they're, in theory, a couple wins away from stealing a bid. So, um, you could argue West Virginia season wasn't all that disastrous. And then they lost in the CBI to Coastal Carolina, which made it kind of um, stained a little bit. But my question for them is, will Oscar Tashibi win the Big 12 Freshman of the Year? I think that's probably going to be a yes. And I think he'll be in the conversation for National Freshman of the Year. I don't know if he'll win it because of Vernon Carey of Duke and a bunch of others. Trace um, Jackson Davis in Indiana. There's other ones that I think are better than Oscar Tishby. But um, Tishby will certainly uh, be the favorite for the Big 12 Freshman of the Year. Tomorrow we're going to do um, Pac-12 SEC and select randoms for uh, what we know and what I question. And now, best bet of the day, brought to you by DraftKings. Well, I have two picks for you today. Um, they are lines, in my opinion, that are a little out of whack. College basketball, I love Auburn minus the two and a half. Um, it was at two and a half. It's on the one and a half. Um, I think that... Um, Auburn is a team that's just on a roll. Everyone just is trying to fade them, but I just don't think this is the right spot. This is not Kentucky that they're playing. It's freaking Alabama, for crying out loud. Like I said, I'll do respect to Nate Oates. I think he's a good coach. They have a good freshman point guard, but this is not the spot to play Alabama. So give me Auburn minus the 2.5. And, and in the NBA, I had a hard time coming up with one. I thought about taking the Blazers. I thought about a couple others. But I like uh, the Lakers minus the 10.5 at home against Orlando. Um, Anthony Davis might be back tonight. If he is, then this is a huge win. If not, I still think they can get it done. They killed a much better Dallas team on the road without Anthony Davis. So I think that they're going to blow out Orlando. They're going to win by 20. I think Dwight Howard will actually have a good game. You think that he would have revenge on this mind, even though it's been so long with Orlando. But um, I just think Dwight play, likes playing well against his former team, so he'll get up for this. LeBron's playing like LeBron. I, I will take the Lakers by 10 half. And the other honorable mention for NBA, I did like um, Oklahoma City, again, minus the two against the Raptors. But um, I didn't feel as strong about that as I do about the Lakers. Before we go, we have to address the uh, firing of Alex Cora from the Red Sox. Um, obviously, this had to do with the cheating scandal. Um, they had a 50-minute long press conference today. Their punishments have not been handed down to them yet. 
and obviously Cora's hasn't either, but they just uh, fired Cora last night. Um, that, that was predictable. And now where do the Red Sox go? Do they hire their bench coach? Do they hire um, somebody like Dustin Pedroia or somebody that um, kind of has ties to the franchise to get the fan base excited? Cora obviously won a World Series with the Sox, but now that's tainted because of the cheating. And last year was a disappointment, didn't even make the playoffs, had some injuries, and now uh, they really um, are in a tough spot. Not just because of this, but they have some decisions to make regarding Mookie Bats and other players on the team that they'd like to keep or not. Um, so not surprising news with um, Alex Cora getting fired. And now the question is, will the New York Mets fire Carlos Beltran? That is the biggest story right now left involved in this, other than uh, Cora's punishment. And um, I think it's 50-50, but it would be LOL Mets if they kept Beltran. But at the same time, they'd be LOLing the Mets if they fired Beltran. So, um... They're in a lose-lose situation here because, well, they're the Mets and Beltron was involved in this thing. And they're going to be saying, like, how can you mad- fire a manager that hasn't even managed a game? But also he was involved in this scandal. So there's reasons to fire him. So it should be interesting to see um, what the Mets end up doing. So that's it for the podcast today. I'll be back tomorrow with the latest on the cheating scandal. College basketball, NBA, NHL, let me know what I question. And the NFL mock draft that I have coming and my best bet as well. Hope you guys have a great day, everybody.